look at tax-free investments and put some of your safest and most producing, highest producing returns in tax-free environments. Welcome to the Wealth Strategy Secrets of the Ultra Wealthy Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs like you exponentially build wealth through passive income to live a life of freedom and prosperity. Are you tired of paying too much in taxes, gambling your future on the stock market, and want to learn about hidden strategies for making your money work for you? And now your host, Dave Wolcott, serial entrepreneur and author of the best-selling book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's show on Wealth Strategy Secrets. Today, we're joined by Carl Fisher. Carl is a Cornell University graduate and third-generation real estate developer with a fascinating background. In the 70s, Carl started his investing journey as a rocket scientist at the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral. Today, he's one of the founders and principals of CAMA, Self-Directed IRA, or CAMA Plan, a nationwide company based in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Throughout his career, Carl has successfully executed plans and overseen over 20 million worth of real estate transactions. His portfolio includes a mix of commercial and residential properties encompassing real estate, notes, and mortgages. Thanks to Carl's unique background, education, and wealth of knowledge in business, finance, technical requirements, and overall management, he's an indispensable asset for his clients in achieving control over their own financial future. Carl, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate you inviting me today. Yeah, absolutely, Carl. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation and in just reading your bio, you know, I think it really sums everything up. You just really hit the nail on the head by saying, helping your clients achieving control over their own financial future. And I think that's what, you know, many of the listeners out there are struggling with, right? With this, with the stock market casino and just not really having control. And you look at your 401k balance, you know, every month and it can be very frustrating. I know I spent years uh, doing that myself and just really wanted to be able to, you know, do something right and kind of reposition that. So really excited to have you here today. Uh, talk about your solution. I think there's a lack of education in the marketplace on what's available for uh, investors who are positioned uh, with capital, you know, in 401ks uh, currently in this country. Uh, so looking forward to talking through that and kind of, you know, creating some clarity. So why don't we th- start things off, Carl? And um, you know, for folks who haven't met or haven't heard of you, let's talk a little bit more your, about your journey and and how you got here. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. But just before we start, I'd just like to tell everybody, you know, I'm not an attorney. I'm not a licensed accountant or tax professional, or even a financial advisor. And Cama Plan doesn't offer any tax or asset advice. They don't sell any investments or any products per se. And we'd like to be considered a neutral third party administrator of uh, tax advantage plans such as IRAs, 401ks, health savings accounts, uh, ESAs, and things like that. Um, And we don't endorse any person or any products or investments uh, just as a general matter of uh, business. But we're happy to work with the individual and his team. Uh, And we do do continuing education for a lot of attorneys, uh, accountants, tax professionals, and realtors so that they can understand self-direction and the rules and regulations associated with it. Um, One of the things that got me into this business was uh, I learned I didn't have a lot of control over taxes, over uh, brokerage houses, investments, over your own 401k. Uh, so I was always looking for some, some other way to invest money because I grew up in a real estate family. My mom and dad were in real estate and their moms and dads were in real estate. So it's a family. And now my myself is in real estate and my kids are in real estate also. So 
I'm biased towards two things. One is real estate and real estate related products. And the other is tax free income. And uh, like a lot of real estate professionals, my father died. Uh, I was launching rockets at Kennedy Space Center at the time. And I took a, an absence to go down and handle the estate. He was only 60 years old when he passed relatively suddenly. And I'm down there working with my mom and trying to settle the estate and thought we had it settled. But then I found out that uh, there was a note on a property that was in default at a like a 28% interest rate. So what I had to do is uh, find money fast to close it out because they were going to start foreclosing on the piece of property and it was worth a lot more than what was owed on it. So I found a uh, individual back in the newspapers, and this was in 1995, that lent me the money. When I lent that money, or when he lent me that money, uh, you know, it was relatively quick and it was at 12%. And, you know, which was good, bringing it down from 28% and taking it out of default mode. What I then learned uh, after signing the papers and things is that the money came from an IRA. And I said, well, that's very interesting. I got the uh, uh, estate and and settled at that point. And I asked him if he would like me to keep the loan with him, but he'd have to reduce the interest rate from uh, 12 to 7 because I could get a 6% loan from the banks. And he just matter of factly said, no, I'm not interested. And I said, well, you know, where are you going to put the money if I pay you back? And he said, there's a lot more lenders than there are. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more borrowers than there are lenders. So I'll have that money deployed relatively quickly. You saw how fast I did it for you. And then I said to him, you know, trying to persuade him, uh, I said, but yeah, but what happens, you know, you know that you've got good loan to value here and that we haven't missed any payments. And he says to me, yeah, don't go down that road because when I gave you this loan, I was hoping that I would foreclose on you because look at how much money I would make. So I kind of like got pushed back both ways. This guy was definitely more experienced than I was. And, and it seemed a lot smarter in that space. And I, you know, told him, yeah, I'll go get the money. And I went back and scratched my head. And uh, then I said, well, I want to do what he's doing, 12 to 18 percent loans. And I don't have to go to work to get the match from the company because I was working at uh, Kennedy Space Center launching rockets at the time. So there was very little information on using IRAs and 401ks. I called up the uh, bank that helped them do the the transaction with me. And they asked me how I got the number. I said, because I just did a transaction with you. And they said, yeah, don't call here. You don't have enough money and we don't work with uh, individuals that aren't clients of the bank. So then I started going out, looking around. And, you know, as you mentioned, I went to Cornell and I know you're affiliated with this school through your family. And I went up there to the library because it was one of the best libraries that uh, I'd known and tried to find information on self-direction. And there just wasn't any. I ended up calling the IRS and asking them and even their IRS professionals couldn't point me in the, in the right direction. So I, you know, they did acknowledge that it existed, but they didn't know how to do it. So, you know, a few more years went by, and I don't know who invented the, uh, the internet, but Al Gore said he did. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I used the internet to find out more information on it. And then uh, I started working with a small group of people. Uh, you know, I'm one of, I'm the oldest of 12 kids, so I have a pretty big network coming into the place. Plus, I was at the Space Center working with a lot of engineers. So I had a little network of people and they basically said, hey, you're good at this. Why don't you open up a company? And my sister uh, had just graduated Villanova a few years earlier and was good with trust uh, accounting, software, et cetera. So she said, yeah, I'll help you do it. So that's how Cama Plan was born, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, Wow, fascinating story. Um, Really told like an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, really finding, you know, a problem to solve 
uh, and taking that as an opportunity to the market. Were there any other uh, self-directed uh, companies that you knew of at that point in time? There was. Uh, Equity Trust was, was uh, okay. there. I learned about them a little bit later. Um, and I didn't really like their business model. And a lot of the people that were uh, with us didn't like their business model. So it was just an opportune time, you know, to look at it from, you know, an investor standpoint and set it up, you know, and that's one of our taglines today is for investors by investors. Because as I said, our family's there and my sister invests in real estate, et cetera. So yeah, we wanted something that's great. that would, would satisfy us and our customers. Yeah. So Carl, um, let's kind of break this down for investors. I'd like this to be, you know, really tangible so that they can kind of walk away with some real insights here. I mean, so let's kind of start at a high level and say, you know, fast forward to t t today. And what do you think is the problem with traditional uh, 401ks and retirement accounts? One is I don't think you have the diversity in traditional 401ks and IRA accounts that you really want. And that led us to the first thing is what is a self-directed IRA? Because a lot of the brokerage houses say they have self-directed IRAs. And we had an attorney, you know, back in, I told you we couldn't find any information on it, but we uh, had an attorney that gave us a definition. Uh, today, I've simplified it to basically a self-directed IRA lets you invest in everything except life insurance and collectibles with those two caveats. Uh, but basically, all the rules are exactly the same for a self-directed IRA as a, you know any IRA that you see out there. I just call self-direction as a, as a adjective uh, if they even teach that in school anymore. But if you look at Schwab's or Fidelity's self-directed IRAs, they only let you buy what they sell. <clears throat> okay, and as I said earlier, we don't sell anything. So you bring to us what you want to buy, whether that's a piece of land, a piece of uh, multi-unit facility, a condominium downtown or a single family home in the suburbs, uh, or even lend money uh, or buy gold, buy into an LLC or a joint ventureship, whatever that asset is, in most cases, we will process that and that will become part of your IRA. So obviously you can see that you have a wider variety of assets and asset classes that you can purchase besides just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So that's that's the main reason that I don't like the way traditionals and 401ks have been going down that road. And you you probably don't remember, but there used to be a software that came on late at night at two o'clock in the morning when I was trying to learn about stocks and bonds. And that software uh, used to turn red when you're supposed to sell green or when you're supposed to buy and yellow to tell you to get ready to do something. Uh, I bought that. I read it. And I was no smarter on the on the stocks and bonds than I was before. Um, I bought a blackjack book at the same time, and I read that. And I think that I would rather play blackjack in Atlantic City or Vegas before I did the stock market. That's that's how anti stock I was, and and that's just probably because I grew up in a real estate family, and I have a cousin who's great in the stock market and worked for Lehman Brothers at one time and he explained a lot of things to me and I just knew it wasn't my forte. So I always tell people you want to invest in what you know and understand and that lowers your risk. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah 100 100% Carl. Yeah, and I I think that you know many fall into that bucket, right? It is if you if you're investing in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, I mean th there are people doing really well, but a lot of those are traders taking on huge amounts of risk uh, as they do that. But your average investor is really, I think, you know, having this one-dimensional path 
which is kind of just, you know, set it and forget it and just hope that the market is going to go up over time. Um, and, you know, I mean, it actually has, right? I mean, the market has increased uh, over time since its inception. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that that people are unaware of is just looking at that compounding over time. And, and really, you need to take into account taxes, fees, and inflation, because they are such an erosion on that growth of what you get, right? And I think people are going to be really surprised when they go to take that money out. So having proper allocation, as you point out, uh, is really, you know, is a really key, you know, for, for smarter investors. Yeah, um, you're 100%, so- you're 100% right. The market's gone up. But so as the price of a gallon of gas, I mean, I used to fill up my car for $5 when I was in high school. Gas was 19 cents a gallon. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you, you're 100% right talking about the inflation and, and uh, other aspects of the economy over time. Yeah. And, and Carl, I mean, from a market perspective, I mean, tell me your thoughts in terms of, you know, where is the industry headed in terms of you know, real estate, alternative assets, you know, what are you guys seeing? Well, you know, everybody calls alternative assets, you know, things like real estate, gold, uh, and you can go back uh, into the Bible and they brought gold, uh, <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, the three kings. So real estate to me is more of a mainline asset, but everybody considers the stock market, stocks, bonds, municipal funds, mutual funds, mainstream investments. I I know one thing. I know that you can't get a set it and forget it plan. You always have to adjust because technology changes, laws change, and the economies change, and geopolitical conditions change. So you always have to have some sort of a plan in place for these variations and these cycles through those types of things. Where are we now in the cycle? Inflation has gone up quite a bit, but as people said, well, is it going to come out? Is it going to keep going up? Uh, Right now, I think that in real estate, in most of the country, uh, housing has stabilized, has definitely slowed the inflation rate down. It was uh, double digits in Florida. I know you're in the Sarasota area. It's still going up in Florida, but Florida is a little bit of an aberration because so many people, I think it's the number one state people are moving to. And if you look at what's happening out there, the supply of houses, for example, is low. Uh, And one of the reasons it's low is because most people have a two, three, four percent mortgage on their property, which keeps their property payments low. And if they've got to sell that house and move into one with seven and a half percent, they're going to take, you know, they're going to have a down, uh, a downward uh, purchase from where they are today in most cases. So I do think that rates are going to, you know, possibly go up a little bit, stay where they are, uh, but I don't think that it's terrible where they are today because I grew up in a 6 to 8% interest rate and cut my teeth on some of my first properties there. However, a lot of people got used to the 2 to 3% interest rates and, uh, you know, they'll have that. That was, This was the first time in my lifetime I've seen 2 and 3% interest rates. So... Uh, I think the supply of houses has to improve uh, before you're going to see rates uh, come down or prices come down. I think uh, interest rates probably will come down a little bit uh, for that as as well. Um, I don't know when. Will it be 24? Will it be 25? Well, you know, I, I'm never good at timing exactly when, when that that is going to hit. I've tried to buy stuff when I thought it was in the trough and it, you know, it lost half again as much as it did when I bought it. So, uh, I'm the wrong guy to ask about the timing, timing of that, of the markets today. Uh, the stock markets just seem to be going higher and higher. Um, I don't understand exactly how that is, but it's probably keeping up 
with the inflation that's out there. But I think inflation is going to fix itself because if you remember, and I'm going to guess maybe six or eight months ago, eggs were twice as much as they are today. So when when we come back to, let's say, April of 2024, and they look back and say, how much were eggs in April of 2023? It's going to look like inflation has subsided. And that's happened in, in other commodities as well. Gas, you know, popped up to almost $5 a gallon, um, you know, a couple of years ago. And that, you know, is now at $4 a gallon. So that's going to look a little lower. But these prices that are out there have definitely increased in the past three or four years. And uh, I think people are going to be living with these prices until the supply issues have changed. And even though their salaries have gone up, uh, it's probably commensurate with the inflation if it is there. But what people don't calculate is that their taxes have gone up because they're making more. So their actual spending power is less. And I think that's why a lot of people feel pain in today's economy, if that makes logical sense moving down the line. Yeah, I think that makes uh, perfect sense. And it's interesting too, you know, traveling through the country, there's definitely some pockets like you, you know, you had mentioned Florida, I mean, other places like the, the Carolinas, Texas, uh, you know, I was just in Nashville recently. It's it's interesting to see these growth pockets of where, you know, people are moving to in the country. So you have this net, uh, you know, migration effect and, 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 you know, what prices are doing in these uh, particular markets. Uh, but I also find, Carl, uh, you know, what's interesting too is, you know, uh, to your earlier point, um, I, I think there's really a trend to moving towards these alternatives and you're right, it is kind of funny that they're referred to as alternatives. They're referred to as alternatives by uh, folks in Wall Street, but gold and real estate <laughs> have been around, you know, as assets, you know, since the beginning of time. But, but it's interesting because even a lot of uh, institutional firms are now creating lines of business. Uh, that are focused on alternatives, right? And trying to identify, you know, some of those opportunities. So I think investors are looking for more control. Investors are looking for more uh, diversification. Um, so, you know, being able to leverage, you know, your existing IRA, because let's face it, you know, Americans have their money typically in two places, in their portfolio. It's in existing, you know, 401ks, some type of IRA uh, plan, uh, or it's in trapped equity in their primary residence, right? So if you can now reposition that to re reduce your risk, improve your yield, um, I think that's low hanging fruit uh, for investors, especially savvy investors who, you know, kind of take control. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, the process, right? If someone is interested in moving to this self-directed uh, vehicle, you know, what does that look like and, and what can you guys offer to help people in that position? Sure. That's a great question. So it's pretty simple. It's like opening up any other uh, IRA or 401k account. You fill out an application uh, with CAMA plan, name, address, beneficiaries, license or passport, some uh, documentation showing that it's who it is. And then simply you fund that account uh, and you can transfer from another IRA. You can contribute for that year or you can roll over an old 401k. That's the primary ways to fund your account. Once your account is open and funded, then you choose your investment type. Uh, and that can be a piece of real estate. It can be a note to an individual. It can be a shares in a debt fund. It can be shares in an equity fund and, you know, purchasing part of an LLC or a limited partnership or a joint venture. So there's all kinds of things you can buy. Once you fill out that paperwork, the only difference between you doing it personally and your uh, plan doing it is it's going to say CAMA plan for the benefit of Dave's IRA or Dave's 401k part of it. And 
Otherwise, you'd fill it out pretty much exactly like you would yourself. Uh, you're going to make that investment. You're going to look at that paperwork. You're going to sign it as read and approved, and it'll get uh, emailed or forwarded uh, to us to sign on behalf of your plan. Once we sign on your plan, we'll send the funds out, uh, whether it be to a title company for a loan or a real estate purchase or to a fund manager for a fund or a syndicator for uh, ownership and a syndication. And those funds are sent and then you sit back, uh, log in online, check your CAMA account and you'll see the uh, rent coming in or the interest payments coming in or the dividends from your uh, uh, fund. And you'll know when those are supposed to be coming in. And then you'll just, you know, within 24 hours of us receiving it, it'll be in your account. And the money is sitting there in FDIC insured accounts uh, so that nobody has to worry about uh, um, over that. And even if it's over $250,000, uh, we make sure that all of it is in accounts that are FDIC insured um, because of the number of clients that we have, there's no issues with that. <clears throat> and people, if people have issues and they have questions, obviously we're always there for them to phone us and ask us any questions about opening up accounts. If they're talking about uh, due diligence on the fund, obviously we'll forward them to the fund managers or, or attorneys that will review the paperwork or something like that. Or we have classes that will teach people due diligence as well. What if everything you thought you knew about investing was wrong? Would you like to create a wealth strategy like the top 1% have and get exclusive access to top private equity deals that provide downside protection, tax efficiency, predictable cash flow, and have a lucrative upside? Discover how with the Pantheon Advantage and join our investor club today at PantheonInvest.com. Okay, that's helpful. Um, let's, one question that I think a lot of folks have, or maybe they have didn't realize they even had uh, until they kind of get into their first opportunity, uh, but let's talk about uh, UBIT. And can you kind of explain what that is and, and how that works inside um, your SDIRA? Sure. Yeah, th there's actually two aspects that I'll talk about on that. One is the actual unrelated business income tax, and two is the unrelated debt financed income. So let's just say uh, you took your money, your IRA or 401k, and you bought a Midas muffler shop or a gas station. And with, with your IRA. Now, what happens is you'll pay on any of the income that, because the IRA owns this Midas muffler shop, the income will be subject to UBIT because it's a business run in an IRA or a 401k. And think about it, if you could get these tax free, there would be no businesses paying any tax anywhere. Everybody would be running them out of their IRAs and 401ks. Because an IRA is considered a trust, they get taxed at trust rates. So once you made $15,000, you'd be taxed at 37%. Uh, but the money would go into your IRA, whether it be a Roth or a traditional, tax-free or tax-deferred. And it would go into that, and then your uh, IRA would fill out what's called a 990T, which is which is an income tax return from the IRS, and they would pay 37% on everything over $15,000. Uh, and I forget, it might be 10% up to $15,000. Uh, so it's something that the... IRS and the Department of Labor put in place so that people wouldn't use their IRAs and 401ks to run businesses and the government would be out the money. The second issue is, and it primarily is with uh, IRAs, is what's called unrelated debt financed income. And if you buy income producing property, 
that isn't government housing or government subsidized, you most likely are going to be required to pay unrelated debt financed income on your uh, rental income if you take a loan on that property. So just to keep numbers easy to do, let's say you bought a property for $100,000, your IRA put $50,000 in it, and you borrowed $50,000 from the bank. Uh, And you made $10,000 a year on, on that property. So what would happen is 50% of that $10,000 would go into your account right away because you have 50% equity in the property. So $5,000 would go right into your IRA. Now you have a $1,000 deduction uh, on the other money. So that would mean $6,000 would go into your IRA. And then you'd have $4,000 that is still subject to tax. Now, out of that four thousand, you're going to be able to take fifty percent of the depreciation on that. Let's say that's another thousand dollars. So you end up with three thousand dollars that is subject to unrelated defined uh, unrelated fund. debt financed yeah. income. Sorry, yeah. and yeah. that that would you know at ten percent that would be three hundred dollars. So basically. Your IRA would pay three hundred dollars on that example for tax that year, so nine thousand seven hundred dollars of the ten thousand would go into your IRA, which in my case, in, in my thought, it's not not bad, right? And then then there's some other calculations. There's some long-term capital gains. Let's say you sold the property, and you know two or three years, you'd have long-term capital gains or pay 20% on the profit that's there. But that number is going to go down every year because you're paying off the, every year that you pay down the uh, uh, principal on the loan. That's going to change how much tax you pay. Instead of 50-50, it's going to be 45, you know, 55 at one year and then 60-40 and 70-30 as time goes on. Yeah, and if it. you And if you pay off your loan, one year before you sell the property, there won't be any tax on it at that point in time. But it's just the way, right? And I asked the government uh, at one point why they do that. And they say, well, you have a an exempt entity that's taking money out of the economy and not paying taxes on it. So they said we had to do something to make sure that the economy and the money taken out of the economy produces some tax for the government. Yeah, it makes, ma- makes sense, Carl. Um, I'd like to address uh, another uh, topic that I, I think is openly debated. Um, so let's talk about this EQRP. And can you help listeners understand uh, what is an EQRP and then how does that compare to an SDIRA? Well, a, a EQRP is a Qualified Retirement Plan. Uh, it's basically a uh, glorified 401k. And as I said, if you had a 401k, it doesn't have UDFI uh, if it borrows money. And, and I don't know if that's an oversight or not, but a lot of people will, do, will, will look at that. But some of the differences in them are, uh, you know, both a 401k and an IRA or a QRP have creditor protection. Both have checkbook capability. However, I don't like checkbook control of IRAs as much as I do for the 401ks because all 401ks are basically under the uh, owner of the company. They're the ultimate, the buck stops here person. So they can run it and having control of the checkbook isn't that big of a deal. However, the Swanson case on the IRA checkbook control causes me some uh, concern because I do think it's going to get overturned and all the experts I've talked to think at some point if it ever gets brought up in in, uh, tax court, it will be overturned based on that. Um, A QRP can invest in life insurance. An IRA can't. 
you're going to have to be part of a 401k when a lot of the QRPs are self-employment. So if you're self-employed, you've got to have a company, you've got to uh, do that. Whereas with an IRA, you don't. So that's one of the negatives. People say, well, why wouldn't everybody have an EQRP? Because one, they don't uh, have their own company and be able to set up their own paperwork, right? Um, a personal loan is also available in a QRP or a 401k. You can borrow money and pay it back, you know, $100,000 or, or $50,000 or half of what's in your account, whichever is less. In a IRA, you can't borrow against it, although some people say, well, you can take out money out of an IRA and put it back in 60 days. So I guess you could say, yeah, that is a loan, but uh, you're only allowed one of those a year, and obviously it's not going to help you unless you need, just need it for a short period of time. The unrelated business tax rules uh, apply to both, uh, but the UDFI rules uh, don't apply to the solo 401k as long as they're buying real estate. So that's, uh, and obviously the one I really like is the fact that in a 401k, you can put up to $67,000 this year and uh, depending on what age you are and 19,000 or 19,500 if you're under 50 and 27,000 if you're over 50 um, into a 401k, something like that. So people always say, well, which one should I have? And my answer is it's not which one, it's which ones. Uh, I think you should have as many as you can, as many as you can afford, uh, you know, to make contributions to. But um, IRAs are a little cheaper to administer and uh, um, 401ks, you can put more more money into them. Uh, that's, that's what I would say uh, overall. And it might be a little bit more expensive than, a, than an IRA. Yeah, that's really helpful, Carl. And and uh, just to clarify, Cama Plan offers both the four hundred one k as well as a QRP option, correct? Yeah, the QRP is is primarily a four hundred one k. Okay. The, we we offer IRAs and four hundred one ks. All the contribution limits are the same. Yeah. Yeah. And anytime I've ever, you know, uh, looked at this kind of option, I think it's important for investors to just, you know, do the math, right. And look at your specific scenario. What are you trying to invest in and taking some of those considerations into play and, and what makes sense, you know, to, to put it into, are there any other considerations, uh, that investors should be aware of? Well, I told you I'm biased towards tax-free accounts, um, but there are tax deferred, and uh, it really kind of there's there's reasons to talk about tax deferred and tax-free, and I want people to understand that because I don't think financial advisors educate people on that. But in the tax deferred world, uh, which there's a lot more money out there, and uh, people are able to save money on their taxes this year. Uh, and I'm sure Dave, you, and probably some other people, uh, you go to your tax account and you give them your information, you know, in January, February, and March, and he calls in and says, if you make a contribution of, you know, $7,000, you're going to be able to get an extra $2,500 off your taxes. So you run out and make a $7,000 contribution for the last tax year. And obviously, it only costs you, you know, five thousand uh, dollars in, in real money. Uh, but the problem with that is, as you grow that money, it grows uh, um, in a taxable account. So when you pull that money out, I mean, it's tax deferred. But when you pull that money out, uh, it's going to be taxed at the rate you're at when you're when you pull it out. You know, assuming you're fifty nine and a half and you're not paying a 10% penalty. And most people think they're not going to be making as much money at, or they won't need as much money when they get older. And I'm going to tell you that's a fallacy. 
Uh, the older you get, the more money you spend. Um, and I don't want anybody really working to make less money in the future because I don't think it, it helps your retirement plans if you're making less money. So uh, in the tax-free world, you pay your tax now uh, and everything you earn, you don't get the break, you don't get the tax break, you don't get the uh, return from your tax return that year, but you put that money into the tax-free Roth account. But everything that Roth account earns in the future is tax-free. So let's say you, you know, we had two people do this. One one did it in the traditional and one did it in the Roth and they turned 70 years old and their the accounts are worth a million dollars. Uh, the one in the Roth is going to take out a million dollars. The one in the traditional is going to be paying 400,000 on the, you know, three or 400,000 on the million dollars. So they're going to end up with uh, six or seven hundred thousand dollars versus the the full million where they could have paid you know two thousand dollars in uh taxes earlier that year you know earlier in their lifetime i should say not that year does that yeah. make sense did i explain that yeah, perfectly. well enough yeah yeah perfectly yeah no i think those are uh great points um this has been really insightful carl i i think there's still such a lack of education in terms of folks um, understanding that there are some options uh, to transitioning that capital into better vehicles uh, that you could, you know, diversify into some alternative assets and everything. Um, so, Carl, if you could give our listeners just one piece of advice about how they could accelerate uh, their wealth trajectory, what would it be? I would say to use more tax-free accounts, worry less about your W-2 salaries and your 1099s and focus on growing your, your Roth account. Uh, I always talk about four types of money, uh, which is W-2 money and then passive income such as rent and then tax deferred and tax-free. And if you made $100,000 in your job, you're probably paying around 40000 in taxes between federal, state, local, and Social Security, Medicare. Um, if you're buying rental properties or passive income, royalties and interest or dividends, and you make $100,000, you are probably only paying 25000 in taxes because you get to not pay Social Security and Medicare on that money. And then tax deferred, you get to keep using all those taxes. The one I use for that is, you know, I'm paying uh, uh, taxes on my interest while others are paying interest on their taxes. Uh, so, you know, tax deferred, you put that money in, you're allowed to use it year after year. You don't um, lose, lose in taxes, so you have more to invest. Um, but then when you pull it out, you'll pay the taxes in the future. So I would say look at tax-free investments and uh, pay attention to that and put some of your safest and uh, most producing, uh, highest producing returns in tax-free environments. Yeah, well said. Appreciate that. So Carl, if people would like to learn more about Cama Plan or connect with you, if they have any questions, what's the best place folks can reach out? <clears throat> Go to our website, camaplan.com. You can request a consultation. You can give us a phone call. Our uh, phone number is 215-283-2868, 215-283-2868. Camaplan.com is C-A-M-A-P-L-A-N.com. Uh, it's got a lot of information on there. All of the information is free. Uh, and it will answer a lot of questions that you can look at and educate yourself on your own. But we love to uh, talk to people. So give us a call. Awesome. 
Really appreciate your time, Carl, and sharing your insights with the audience. And thanks to the audience uh, for spending your most important resource with us, your time. If you guys are enjoying the show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes or any other uh, podcast uh, medium that you prefer. Uh, We really appreciate that to bring in uh, excellent guests such as Carl. So until next week, thanks again. Appreciate it, Dave.